So without much ado, thank you, Nathan, for agreeing to talk to us today and over to you. I appreciate the ado, Tim, and thanks to you and Sally and Annie and the British Sporting Art, as the British Sporting Art Trust for having me uh, here today. I, I wish I were in Britain to speak to you in person. Um, alas, um, I can't be, but if, um, if I were, uh, some of the members of my family who have, who have joined to root me on here today wouldn't be able to join, so. <laughs> One of Francis Barlow's earliest known drawings shows a huntsman charging down the slope of a hill. He raises a hand and carries a pole in the other. He calls. A dog lumbers along behind attached by a lead. This stocky fellow is a southern mouthed hound, a now extinct breed formerly employed to track the hare through hilly terrain. According to Barlow's contemporary Richard Bloom, these heavy and slow dogs were proper for such as delight to follow them on foot, a method termed hunting under the pole. And the dogs were trained to stop in their tracks when the pole was thrown down in front of them. Dating to the late 1640s, when Barlow was just in his 20s, the drawing is full of movement and spirit and signed with a proud flourish. And it's difficult to imagine uh, such a jolly looking drawing, at least it appears jolly to me, uh, being produced in the midst of the English Civil War. Barlow was almost certainly a huntsman. Although we have no verifiable likeness of the artist, we might imagine this drawing to be autobiographical. Note the distinctive pommel on the sword, shaped like a bird of prey. On a practical level, the hunt would have supplied Barlow with the bodies of the creatures that he painted. Like the artists of the Low Countries who provided the images of animals for hunting in mythological pictures, Jan Bruegel the Elder in collaboration with Peter Paul Rubens, for example, Barlow maintained a catalog of studies from life worked up in oil on small pieces of canvas from which he copied and adapted to make different pictures. Barlow's earliest biographer, Bainbridge Buckridge, recorded that the artist initially trained as a portrait painter with William Shepard, whose tutelage he left because his fancy did not lie that way, his genius leading him wholly to the drawing of foul fish and beasts. On 4th of March, 1650, a year after the death of Charles I, Barlow paid a fee to become a member of the Painter Stainers Company, meaning he could practice his trade unobstructed in the city of London. Here we are with the still life. Uh, by the early 1650s, uh, Barlow was trying his hand at the new uh, genre of still life recently imported from the Netherlands. His attempts do not overly moralize like their ca continental counterparts, but reflect a fresh and careful observation of nature. One dated 1656 includes a spread of field fair, partridge and wood pigeon whose upturned and hanging bodies afforded Barlow the opportunity to study the color and pattern of feathers, of their feathers. Around the same time, Barlow made a remarkable leap to depicting live birds and animals set in landscapes which imagined their natural settings. In a canvas of about 1658, Birds and other creatures are instilled with a spark of life achieved with delicate dabs of paint. Such a picture afforded a window onto a fleeting moment in the natural world, whether we believe such a motley assortment ever gathered. Barlow achieved early fame. In 1656, the date of the still life, the courtier John Evelyn visited the artist with the clergyman and natural philosopher John Wilkins, who would serve as the first secretary to the Royal Society. They had both taken an interest in Bar Barlow's art. Evelyn's diary noted their encounter with Barlow, the famous painter of foul birds and beasts. From the beginning, Barlow supplemented his income as a painter with projects and book illustration, model books of birds and beasts, that is sources of designs for other artists to draw from, and political prints. His magnum opus, an illustrated edition of Aesop's Fables, first published in 1666, which he issued from his shop, the Golden Eagle in New Street near Shoe Lane, was itself a politically charged venture. 
The moral tales enacted by beasts offered interpretations which reflected the times. Uh, for instance, here, the theme of deception in the fable of the fowler and the partridge. In a magical world where communication is possible between creature and human, an ensnared partridge held in the hands of the fowler promises that if it is set free, it will lead the rest of its flock into the net. The, the fowler doubly damns the bird for treachery to its own kind, an outcome that would have resonated for those betrayed during the recent civil war. Barlow's politics leaned towards the royalist cause. During the war, many of his circle of friends went into exile on the continent, among them fellow artists Wenceslas Haller and William Faithorn, the elder. During the interregnum, they all waited in hope for the return of the king. One of the broadsides Barlow designed after the restoration was the most magnificent riding of Charles II to the parliament, which documents a procession that took place on the 22nd of April, 1661, the day before the coronation. Riding behind the king is Barlow's patron, George Monk, once Oliver Cromwell's right-hand general and then orchestrator of the king's return. Monk was now elevated as Duke of Albemarle and master of his majesty's horse. Barlow also produced satirical broadsides, some lampooned the Dutch, with whom the English fought three largely maritime wars in the 17th century over matters of trade. In the cheese of Dutch rebellion, a giant round of cheese, perhaps a howda, is a dangerous import. Like the Trojan horse, it conceals Dutch invaders who are consumed by the devil crouched on top. The devil then passes them out the other side, transforming him into his vile brood. Similar imagery appears in the playing cards Barlow designed at the time of the Popish plot, when it was widely believed that a group of Jesuit priests were plotting to murder the king. In one design, the assassins are deposited by a devil who declares that his paunch shall never be emptied. In the late 1670s and early 80s, Barlow became the artist for the emerging Whig cause. He produced a host of anti-Catholic playing cards and broadsides that fuel, fueled the paranoia, xenophobia, and violence related to the larger exclusion crisis. That is, when a group of Whigs, including Barlow's patron, William Cavendish, 4th Earl of Devonshire, attempted to pass a series of bills through Parliament, preventing the King's Catholic brother, James the Duke of York, from ever ascending the throne. In the meantime, there was an increasing complexity in Barlow's paintings, the interactions of creatures enabling the development of little narratives. In the game larder of 1672, for example, a still life is offset by the action of keen scented and curious dogs and the rooster and hen that poke through the basket. The open window is like a painting within a painting, an idyllic landscape, which is the source of the spoils. There's often more than meets the eye uh, in Barlow's pictures. Among the largest was the decoy. Originally painted for Denzel Onslow of Pierford Court in Surrey, John Evelyn admired this picture when he dined at Pierford in August of 1681, writing that the hall was adorned with paintings and fowl and huntings, the work of Mr. Barlow, who is excellent at this kind of thing from the life. After a meal supplied by the self-sufficient estate, Evelyn was taken by Onslow to see sport at the decoy. He had never seen so many herons. There's arguably a theme of deception in the decoy, which relates to the political moment of the late 1670s. While the birds in the foreground are distracted from the attack from a red kite in the upper right-hand corner, a more nefarious lurk at threat lurks behind where the decoy man and his dog, the piper, can be seen under the hut. Images of decoys used to trap people rather than birds are found in anti-Catholic satire of the period. Worked by the Pope, those nets threatened to capture European nations. The Barlow thought in such metaphors can be seen in another playing card, all his fish that comes to the net. This is produced later from another set, not the Popish plot playing cards. This shows when a Protestant minister and a Catholic priest are pulled ashore, there is little difference between the two species. So Barlow is no mere animal painter. 
versatile and prolific. His works are a chronicle of his times. He was well-connected. He had a feel for historical precedent. He was politically minded with royalist and Protestant leanings, and he was a witty and imaginative storyteller. He was not the simple and honest painter described by the art historian Ellis Waterhouse, nor as David Piper put it, as naive and basic as that of Aesop, whom he illustrated. He was, as one would expect from a huntsman, cunning, a kind of trickster. But who was Francis Barlow really? The received wisdom tells us that Barlow was born in Lincolnshire, but this has no basis. The artist himself proclaimed on the title page here of his earliest model book of birds that he was a native of London, Ndiginem Londoninsem at the end there. The estimate of his birth date around 1626 is relatively recent. In fact, Barlow was baptized four years earlier on 4th of September, 1622 at St. Bartholomew the Less in West Smithfield. Instead of being a provincial painter who made his life in the city, Barlow was a city boy who became a country painter. Francis was the son of a stationer and bookseller named Timothy Barlow and his wife, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was the daughter of the haberdasher and mercer, trader in cloth, usually imported cloth, John Dagger and his wife, Joan. John's father, James Dagger, had been a warden in the company of Turners. Barlow's maternal line reached back to at least the 1560s in London. On the other side, Timothy's father, William Barlow, was Church of, a Church of England clergyman. William was longtime rector of St. Mary's Easton in Hampshire, where Tim Timothy and his siblings were probably born. By 1615, William had been made Archdeacon of Salisbury. William was also a natural philosopher who published on navigational instruments and on the nature of the magnet. From about 1605, he had served in the royal household as chaplain and tutor to James I's son and heir, Henry Frederick, Prince of Wales. William was thus part of court, a court culture described as England's lost renaissance, a flourishing of the arts and sciences that lost momentum when Henry died of typhoid fever in 1612 leaving his younger brother to become king, Charles. Timothy was made free. Barlow's father, Timothy, was made free of the stationer's company in 1615 and within a year had established a shop in St. Paul's churchyard. Soon after, he was publishing the scientific works of his father, William. On the 29th of June, 1618, Timothy married Elizabeth Dagger. In quarters attached to the bookshop in the shadow of the old cathedral, Francis, the eldest son, and his siblings, Anne, William, and Amy, were born or spent their earliest years. The medieval Barlows had been cloth traders in Buckinghamshire and Essex. Their descendants, many of them clerics in the newly established Church of England, were landowners in Hampshire and South Wales. Among them was William's father, also William Barlow, who around 1540 married Agatha Wellsburn, a former nun in the Catholic Church. One of the first Anglican priests to marry and have children, William was eventually consecrated Bishop of Chichester by Elizabeth I. One of his brothers, Roger Barlow, was a merchant and navigator who accompanied Sebastian Cabot on a voyage to South America in the 1520s. He was the first Englishman to provide a detailed eyewitness account of America. He may have inspired his nephew, the younger William Barlow, to study navigation. In his book, The Navigator's Supply, William states that he would have liked to have been an explorer himself, except by natural constitution of body, even when I was young and strongest, I altogether abhorred the sea. However, this ambition was fulfilled by one of his sons, Thomas Barlow, this is a brother of Timothy, a sailor and mathematician who rose through the ranks to become clerk of the acts for the Royal Navy in the time of Charles I. The diary of Samuel Pepys refers to a Thomas Barlow, who in July 1660 lodged at, and I quote Pepys, the Golden Eagle in the New Street between Fetter Lane and Shoe Lane, the precise address of Francis Barlow's shop. It turns out that this Thomas Barlow, whose position as clerk Pepys coveted, was Timothy's brother, Francis's paternal uncle. Assumed by Pepys to have died or uh, disappeared, this old consumptive man, as Pepys called him, wriggled his way out of the woodwork at the restoration. 
Pepys struck a deal with Thomas Barlow so that he could take over his position, paying him part of an annuity until one of them died. And when the agreement was drawn up, Thomas Barlow traveled from Winchester and stayed with his nephew. It so happens, as I've discovered, that this was the same Thomas Barlow who in his youth had accompanied William Fielding, Earl of Denby, to India and Persia as personal secretary. After quitting Denby, the return voyage took Barlow to Mauritius and the Cape of Good Hope. In South Africa, he climbed Table Mountain, surveying it with instruments he had inherited from his father, William, as recorded by his travel companion, Peter Mundy. They observed extraordinary fauna, including penguins and flying fish. Back in London, in 1634, Barlow and Mundy paid a trip uh, to Tredeskin's Ark, the Cabinet of Rarities in Lambeth that would become the basis of Oxford's Ashmolean Museum. In that year, Francis Barlow would have been a boy of 12. Did his uncle inspire him with stories of faraway lands and strange creatures? Thomas, who would name Francis Barlow, his nephew in his will, appears to have played a crucial role in Francis's life. In 1625, going back now, when Francis was not yet three, Britain suffered one of the worst outbreaks of plague in its history. In London alone, it claimed 35,000 lives or a sixth of the population in the space of a year. Among them was Timothy's father, was Barlow's father, Timothy. He was likely dead by the time his father-in-law, John Dagger, drafted his will in June, mentioning my grandchild, Francis Barlow, which or who I now keep. This suggests that Francis and his mother and siblings had moved into the Dagger household by then. John Dagger died that August and Francis was probably thereafter raised by his mother and maternal grandmother. His other grandfather, William Barlow, had died in May. Under these circumstances, Thomas Barlow appears to have been the strongest link that Francis retained to his father's family. We now have a picture of an artist who was born into a family of eminent and entrepreneurial connections of gentlemen clerics, navigators, natural philosophers, writers, publishers, booksellers on the one side and of artisans and shopkeepers on the other. Timothy's trade helps to explain how Barlow quickly established himself as a book illustrator with ties to numerous publishers and printmakers, connections to the royal court through Barlow's grandfather, William, and perhaps also through his civil servant uncle, Thomas, may have provided him with the opportunity to work with the German artist Francis Klein at the, Mort at the Mortlake Tapestry Works during the late 1630s. And it's long been thought uh, since Walter Shaw Sparrow was writing about Barlow 100 years ago now uh, that Klein was one of Barlow's teachers. Barlow may have been one of the young hands who assisted with Klein's tapestry designs, which included emblems, fables, and scenes of the hunt. Barlow may have also helped in making copies after the Acts of the Apostles tapestry cartoons by Raphael, acquired uh, for the Royal Collection by Charles I in 1623. There's the distinct similarity between the size and poses of the birds in the foreground of the miraculous draft of fishes, for instance, and those in the foreground of the decoy. Despite Barlow's ancestry, the situation of his youth, especially the untimely death of his father, would have necessitated that he largely make his own way. Barlow married twice, first to a woman named Elizabeth, who likely died from childbirth complications after bearing their son, Edward, in 1653. Two years later, Barlow remarried to Sarah Plantin. Plantine. They had three children, Sarah, Francis, and Elizabeth, all baptized in the early 1660s at St. Bride's Fleet Street, just steps from the Golden Eagle. Sadly, Edward died to age seven around the same time. Further tragedy followed. The plague of 1665, which superseded the one of 1625, may have taken Barlow's uncle Thomas, and although Barlow was one of Thomas's beneficiaries, the fire of London tore through his shop and home in the following year. Most of the copies of the first edition of Aesop were destroyed. The artist had to start anew. In the years after the fire, Barlow in financial straits dependent on friends for work. It was in this context that the stationer and print publisher John Overton 
commissioned the drawings for several ways of hunting, hawking, and fishing according to the English manner, 1671. The 13 etchings by Haller and other hands constitute the first British sporting prints. The project also began a trend for Barlow, who increasingly focused on images of country life, culminating over the next decade and a half in the pictures at Pureford, like the decoy, another extensive group of paintings of fowl, fish, and sport for William Drake of Chardelot's, one of which you see here, this one of hawk uh, on a partridge, and the dozens, um, of, dozens of illustrations for the gentleman's recreation, a, span, a, a manual on sporting art. Perhaps it's no coincidence that the emergent Whig party for whom Barlow crafted so many images during the exclusion crisis was called the country party. Were pictures of country subjects political by association or made to be political? If so, we might call Barlow the, country's, the, the country party's painter. Several ways continued Barlow's lifelong design of source books and images for artists and craftsmen. In the first scene, hare hunting, our eye is taken around the, the landscape, beginning with a gentleman on horseback at left, continuing with the hounds sniffing in the foreground and following the pack up the hill to the hare. A huntsman like the one in Barlow's early drawing stands at the center, lifting a pole and calling. Several of the dogs in Barlow's preparatory drawing, seen here at upper left, were repeated in southern mouthed hounds and hare at Glendon Park, uh, where they have taken on individuating patterns uh, and coloring. In angling, rods and lines fill the air, crisscrossing and connecting the figures in their mutual activity. The moments of contemplation afforded by angling were sacred, as expressed by Isaac Walton in The Complete Angler. The enjoyment is emphasized by the verses, possibly by Barlow himself, which take us beyond the scene. Angling on riverbanks, trolling for pike is noble sport when as the fish doth strike. And when your pleasure's over, then at night, you and your friends do eat them with delight. Barlow's preparatory drawing for angling is even more graceful and atmospheric than the print. The trees are loosely rendered and seem to shake uh, in the breeze this wonderful piece uh, now in a private collection, <laughs> unknown to me. The print was popular to judge from the repetition of the figure on the left. He appears in reverse in Hannah Woolley's Accomplished Lady's Delight, 1675, where he's joined by a woman fishing up river. The same motif was adapted in plaster work at Denham Place in Buckinghamshire by William Parker around 1693. In addition to the decorative there was a political reason for producing several ways, not surprising for a project involving Barlow. In the same year that the prints were published, 1671, Parliament passed an act for the preservation of the game in order to curb poaching. Specifically, unless one owned land valued at 100 pounds per year, that is freehold, or leased land, copyhold, worth 150 pounds a year for a term of 99 years or more, the technical there, Permission was required from royally appointed gamekeepers to hunt. Huntsmen who transgressed the rules risked having their dogs and their equipment confiscated. Naturally, many were outraged by the act, which suddenly prevented them from hunting, even sometimes on their own land. The act was precipitated by long-held tensions between the landed gentry and the merchant class, a divide which paralleled the one between Cavalier and Roundhead uh, during the Civil War. During the Civil War and uh, interregnum, inter many of the gentry had estates confiscated uh, or their property inordinately taxed. And after the restoration, member of, members of the merchant class who had, who had displaced some of those old families were begrudged. The Game Act allowed the gentry to reassert ownership over the land and the game, the content of the land, it was claimed, was being rapidly destroyed by rampant huntsmen with nets and guns. So something had to be done. The act was also likely a strategy for keeping weapons out of the hands of disorderly persons. So people that tended not to, to, to disobey uh, the act the, or the law that based on the act, the game law, um, tended to be disorderly persons. So you would take their weapons away. So this is a way to control um, weapons in the hands of people. 
Despite the restriction of freedom that the act would have placed on someone of limited means like Barlow, his images of the hunt seem to support the cause of the gentry whom he counted as, as pat on his patrons. The presence of so many well-dressed gentlemen on horseback or fishing by the stream evoked the royal privilege of hunting as it had existed before the Civil War, lending support to the act. In addition to their attractive design, perhaps it was the political appeal of the prince that made them suitable to be copied from to decorate country houses. And at last, uh, we come to the last horse race uh, run before Charles II uh, of blessed memory. This has been called the first single sheet horse racing print. And in that sense, it signaled a beginning uh, in that art. It is also the last known work that Barlow himself designed and etched. And it was produced on an impressive scale for a print about one by one and a half feet. Issued in 1687, it's a commemorative, even nostalgic piece. It represents a race that took place three years before on the 24th of August, 1684, the Protestant feast day of St. Bartholomew's, just five months before the death of Charles II. Charles was the first monarch to place bets in his own name at Newmarket and Burford Downs. In the print, he watches the event from a box draped with Persian carpets, accompanied by the Duke of York, courtiers and attendants. Windsor Castle looms large behind. Just beneath the box on the right, the clerk of the scales ensures that each rider carries the same weight. Striped uniforms and caps distinguish the jockeys. Barlow recorded details that would have otherwise been lost. In the distance, we have a pastoral landscape representing Datchet Mead, not Dorset uh, Ferry, with barges and rafts on the Thames and a flock of ducks over the trees. At the top of the print, the date and the title appear within a cartouche made up of the royal insignia. At the bottom, an inscription within a laurel wreath asserts that the image was drawn from the place and designed by Francis Barlow. This would seem to tell us that Barlow was present at the event. The topography has been questioned by some authors, but I think this misses the point. Barlow may have produced multiple drawings on the spot and then composed the whole later in keeping with his, his technique of painting. This does not mean that the parts of the scene are not true to what he saw. It has been suggested that Barlow intended to evoke the glory day, days of the dead Protestant monarch during the turbulent reign of the Catholic James II, who did in, indeed come to the throne. This makes a complete sense for an artist who had spent so much time and energy uh, as the satirist for the Whig cause. But the political message of the last horse race is not overt, and there's a lightheartedness in the production. Notice the spaniel invading the scene on the lower left, barking at the leading horse, a bit of comic relief. Barlow was now in his 65th year, and in 17th century terms, in the last stage of his life. In the same year as the last horse race, he published the second edition of Aesop. He had been working on it since 1678, when its reprise as a political venture was no doubt stimulated by the exclusion crisis. From his vantage point, nine years later, life was still uncertain, an outlook which perhaps resonates with our own. Though Barlow offered a salve, a guide in the art of the fable, which drew upon the book of nature. As he put it to the Earl of Devonshire in the dedication, this book ascribed to Aesop in a plain and simple form contains the substance of moral philosophy and perhaps as much truth in order to the conduct of life as history itself commonly affords us since tis the misfortune of mankind that the present times as little dare to relate truths as the future can know them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... Nathan, uh, you filled a fantastic gap in the knowledge, uh, or in our knowledge, uh, of uh, Barlow's early life and his influences and his connections. And I'm sure there's more to come when the book is published. Indeed. <laughs> I'm sure you haven't given us everything yet. When is the book to be published, or what are your plans? You weren't supposed to ask that question. 
<laughs> um, my plan is to finish the book very soon and to publish it very soon <laughs> over the next couple of years. How about that? <laughs> okay. We're waiting for it. Thank you. I really appreciate that support. <laughs> um, we've talked, uh, and I'm very conscious when I was right, um, back up a bit. Uh, we bought a, a set of prints, several ways of hunting, hawking, fishing in the summer, and we're delighted to add it to the collection of the BSAT. Right. Um, and always talking about uh, Barlow uh, as the father of British sporting art. And yet I became conscious when I was doing it that I didn't quite know what I was writing about. Um, have you been able to explore what influence he had on British sporting art after? Uh, the period that you've concentrated on? Yeah, it's a it's a very good question. Um, so it seems to me that Barlow stops painting, as far as I have discovered, and according to what I've found in the way of his paintings in the early 1690s. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, it's around that time um, that he actually starts to deal in some paintings. He may have been doing this all along, but I don't know. For instance, he sells to the Earl of Kent a picture by old Bruegel or Peter Bruegel the Elder, um, I presume, um, of a convention of witches. So he's got a collection of, of art, apparently, that he's selling. And um, he, he sort of lapses into a kind of obscurity despite the fact that Bainbrig Buckridge um, writes this first biographical entry and publishes it, which is riddled with errors, but thank goodness we have it anyway, in 1706, you know, two years after Barlow dies, Buckridge says that Barlow died in 1702. So he obviously never knew him. He probably hardly knew people that knew Barlow. And fashions were changing. Um, there was a lot of art being imported from, um, from the continent. Um, and sporting art, or I should say animal pictures and pictures of huntings, um, they, they sat very low on the ladder in the newly established academic hierarchies of painting, which placed history painting, histories of, you know, with, with figures enacting mythological and biblical and moral subjects uh, at the top, portraiture next and, and, you know, working your way down through things like landscapes um, to, the, to the low, um, you know, bottom of the barrel, which is animal painting. <laughs> so there's several reasons why Barlow is sort of forgotten immediately after his lifetime. And it's a very interesting historical question. It's got to do with the way that British art and the perception of British art is changing at the time. Um, you know, Barlow was all but forgotten until the 20th century as the uh, artist of the political satires, for instance. That's only discovered again in the 1950s. So um, we sort of lose the whole Barlow in the 18th century. Now, it has been said by many writer, writers, as you point out, I think, uh, in a way that Barlow didn't have any immediate influence in art. Indeed, the next uh, horse racing print won't come, you know, until I think it's the 1740s or 30s with Peter Tillemans. This is a long time, maybe the 20s, after uh, a long time after Barlow's uh, productions. And it's, it's a very different kind of image than what Barlow uh, had produced. Um, I would argue, um, because I have seen physical evidence of it, um, that Barlow did influence through kind of sublimation um, people like uh, Thomas Buick, um, printmakers who illustrated books and also produced um, illustrated editions of Aesop, uh, James Northcote, who did the same. We know James Northcote collected Francis Barlow's prints. Um, the Royal Academy acquires a copy of Barlow's Aesop. It's a 1703 printing of the 1687 edition in the, 17th, in the 1770s, early in its history. So there's a recognition of Barlow's importance, but not much is known about him still. He's recognized as important, but you know that people don't have the whole picture. So I think that probably the interest in Barlow was quite antiquarian and confined to a small circle of people in Britain in the 18th and 19th century. And that partly explains why he doesn't have an immediate effect. But his paintings were still lurking in, in various country houses uh, and on the market. 
Um, and he's more influential through his prints, which continue to be struck from the plate through the 18th century. And I, you know, you could go into a print shop in the 1720s and the 1770s, uh, even the early 1800s, and you could buy Barlow prints or prints after Barlow. And I think these were seen by people like Buick. I think they were seen by people like Stubbs, Northcote. I know they were seen by Samuel Howitt, who um, you know, is uh, um, related by marriage to Thomas Rowlandson, whose line often is mistaken for Barlow's in the past. Um, so there is an influence, but it needs to be, there's more work to be done there. There's more trace to be done. Now, Barlow's more influential, I know it's a long answer, on the continent, the European continent. As early in the six, as I published on this, going back to the 1650s, some of his prints of birds and animals, his model book prints, are copied in Paris. Uh, and they also appear in Lyon uh, and in Antwerp, Amsterdam, Cologne, all during the 17th century. And there are artists looking to Barlow's poses of creatures, even artists that are studying animals afresh themselves. They're using Barlow's poses sometimes to register those studies. So there is something going on there. And Barlow does have some kind of influence, uh, but more needs to be traced. Uh, well, a full answer. Uh, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps we should be uh, calling him the father of European sporting art. Um, certainly he appears to have that influence. I'm going to combine two questions. Uh, one, uh, you've referred to European influences as you were going through. Mm -hmm. uh, Wenceslas Holler was a collaborator or collaborator. Uh, did Barlow ever travel outside Britain? Uh, oh. Is there any evidence of that? And then another question is, um, do you pick up European influence on his style uh, when you've been going through the pictures? Uh, Do I see European can, influence? Can we say that this is a British uh, style that he's uh, influencing? It's a lovely question. Um, yeah, so the travel question is one of these very frustrating ones for me, because the short answer is that we don't know. We don't know either way. I don't have proof that he didn't leave the British Isles at some point. Um, nor that he, uh, you know, staged his whole life in Britain. We, we don't know. We know that he traveled around Britain. At least circumstantial evidence suggests he was up in Scotland, for instance. Horace Walpole tells us he probably had this information from the antiquarian George Virtue, who knew some people that knew Barlow, um, that Barlow was hiking in Scotland one day and came upon a, a wild cat, which before his eyes was taken up uh, into the air uh, by an eagle probably an urn, a sea eagle. And the Barlow huntsmen, uh, after they had had this mortal struggle together in the air, bird and cat, felt they fell to the ground. He he finished them off and took them back to his studio for study. And there's a there's actually a print, I believe it's by Francis Place after Francis Barlow, um, commemorating that event. And it's it's just the kind of yarn I think Barlow would have spun. <laughs> but it also speaks to his, his witnessing of nature. So he's up in Scotland and he, he's, he's traveled around Britain, um, I believe. Um, I have a hunch he has. Um, did he leave the British Isles? That question we don't know, but I'd find it surprising if he didn't, given his royalist leanings, and given, given the fact that um, Haller, who he worked with very closely. Haller made so many different prints um, after Barlow, um, right after Haller returned from his own uh, royalist exile. They were working right away. I, I, I believe that they knew each other before, I can't prove it at the moment, but that they knew each other before Haller uh, left for the exile. Um, and William Faithorne as well, who I, um, I've conjectured helped to promote Barlow's designs through French publishers uh, in Paris in the 1650s when he was in exile. But, um, but as I say, I can't prove whether or not he left. Um, you know, there is this, um, there are these new genres of painting that emerge in Britain uh, in really starting in the, in the, third quarter, middle of the 17th century, and they're being imported from 
uh, from the continent, you know, from Italy with its sense of narrative, from uh, Holland with its moralizing uh, Vanitas, uh, still lifes, hunting scenes and so forth. And they're being imported to a place that had been dominated for a long time by portraiture, Britain. And Barlow, you know, that story that Buckridge tells of Barlow training as a face painter, portrait painter, and then leaving to, you know, leaving that uh, to become the painter of birds and animals, I think is, um, it's it's a metaphor, probably. It's pro it's true, I'm sure, but it could be true, but um, uh, literally true, but he... Um, he has he's leaving portraiture behind uh, essentially to do something brand new and arguably it is the collapse of the court at the time of the civil war and that interregnum period even though it was a largely puritan period which fostered these new genres that were starting to emerge including landscape and still life um, and Barlow is a part of that, and that's when he rises to fame, you know, and historians for a very long time would say um, that Cromwell didn't like art. <laughs> you know, this was a kind of puritanical society that uh, abhorred those kinds of things. But in fact, um, he was, Cromwell himself was a great patron of, of the arts, as Kevin Sharp and others have shown, you know. Um, Right, right, right. Uh, what do I see in Barlow in terms of the continent? I, you know, I see uh, the impetus there for um, doing these new things, um, but I see um, something, can we call it English or British? Um, something that is pared back more, something that it has less of an emphasis on, as I say, the, the, the um, uh, the moralizing aspect. I think he's a documenter in many ways, at least in the early um, parts of his years before he starts to create what I call these moral natural history pictures. Um, and uh, there are earthy tones to Barlow, um, which uh, he's using a particular palette, which has sometimes been criticized, which is particular to him, I think it's, um, so it's a difficult question, but you've, you've given me something to think about. What would you say about uh, the way the continent seems to have influenced Marla? I think I'm uh, relying on you a bit. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but I hope it doesn't delay the book. Um, <laughs> another question. Uh, how do you account for the crowdedness of the pictures? You've got numerous and various breeds of birds uh, in the sky and the land, even the number of fishermen sharing a small pool. Um, is, the, yeah. is that a political link that, uh, is there something there that we should be looking out for? Is there some meaning in those pictures that we're not picking oh, up? Yeah, I, I, believe, I believe there is. Um, so the first thing I will say about the crowdedness, um, I, I there are authors who have called his pictures crowded that Barlow had a sort of poor vacui, which, you know, he had to fill every space and plug a bird in um, every spot in the sky. Um, otherwise, the whole thing would fall apart for him. <laughs> but um, I see I see a great sense of design in the pictures, uh, although they might not be to everybody's taste, um, each to his own. Uh, in this picture, for example, which is probably one of the most crowded that we know of, although it's a large, it was, it was a large picture, eight and a half by 11 feet. So you try to imagine that it's a, it's a wall of a picture. Um, there is a perceivable and I think rather elegant design, even, even though it's composed of and it's, com it's completely artificial, of course. He's bringing these individual studies in. This is not a scene that he's absolutely seen in real life. This is what I'm saying we have to look very closely. You see the, the funnel of birds uh, that, that passes around the central tree. Um, the hawk, for instance, pursuing the male mallard there in the upper right-hand corner. And then um, the ducks that are receding on the right behind the tree and then emerging on the left, uh, this um, woodcock there or snipe is um, kind of out of the way. 
um, not following the pattern, but we've, you've got the heron here on the left, which um, is flying upward um, to follow that, uh, the continuation of that, um, that pattern uh, that I see. And Barlow has, has put these birds into a kind of arrangement uh, in the picture. So um, the crowdedness is the result of his own taste, I suppose, and um, for filling the, the picture with the kinds of riches that he has studied from life individually. Um, and um, on the other hand, um, yes, I do believe that we can, um, if we place some of these pictures into context with the times and with uh, Barlow's printed works, uh, his uh, book illustrations, which were political, and his, his broadsides and so forth, especially around the time of the um, exclusion crisis, read um, we can, I think we can read not necessarily a, um, a specific political um, ploy necessarily in the pictures. I think that would be pressing it too far and I would be hard pressed to prove it, but a more a kind of um, moral problem that might be hinted at in the pictures, um, which relates to the politics of the time. Right. So, you, you know, there are pictures by Hondekoiter, for instance, a contemporary of Barlow, um, who there's a famous uh, pictures, um, I think at a Hetlow Palace in, in Holland, where the individual birds represent the different nations that are battling for ground in Europe. I don't think that's what Barlow's doing. Uh, that ca that uh, question came uh, from Gregory Fliss, I suspect uh, a relation. Oh. I don't know him, but uh, he sounds interesting. <laughs> um, uh, a, a question from Karen Fladdick, who I've been working with uh, a lot on earlier question and racehorse portraiture. Um, we don't see many horses in Barlow's work, and yet we know at the same time we've got um, uh, Jan Vick um, working and producing portraits. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there many horses in Barlow's work? Um... So the the only, um, there are in drawings and prints. There's a, you know, there's a drawing at the British Museum and a, a plate after it for one of the model books uh, in the, the 1650s, early 1660s. He does horses from time to time. Um, there was a, uh, a picture um, which is listed uh, sadly on in the group of uh, you know Nazi looted art, um, which was apparently ascribed to Barlow, which I've never seen an image of, and so I can't speak to the, the veracity of whether it's Bar Barlow or not of figures on horseback. And Walter Shaw Sparrow um, said that he saw uh, uh, the shadow. Uh, of a horse under a raking light under one of the uh, the Clandon pictures. Is it one of the Clandon pictures? Or it might be one of the Turk Drake pictures. Clandon. <laughs> I can't remember at the second. But he may have tried his hand at horses and been dissatisfied. Now, the, the only picture of a horse or a pony that I know of is in the Turk Drake collection. And that is a portrait of... Um, Master Montague Drake, uh, the son of uh, son and heir of William Drake of Amersham, um, with his pony and an attendant, um, which I I so wanted to show today, um, but um, you'll have to have me back another day to do that or wait for the book. Um, and I believe uh, firmly that um, that pony is painted in full by Barlow, and I think it's it's. It's rather a, a beautiful thing, beautiful animal. Thank you. Uh, I think this will have to be the last question, um, probably a wide ranging question. Is there anything else to learn? Other areas that you're studying uh, to open out more about Barlow? Oh yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, he is, he, I would say that Barlow was even more wide ranging than I, I than I've led on, um, and you know, in the essay today. And I, I hope that um, people um, 
<laughs> some plug for my book. Uh, just look, look, at, look in the book and, and see what they can find. Because I think there's a little bit of Barlow for everyone. But, uh, you know, Barlow is uh, something that I hardly talked about today was uh, Barlow's involvement with the depiction of what we would call, uh, what we would have called exotic creatures. Um, you know, in an age of uh, colonialism and still in an age of colonialism, but um, where um, Britain is starting to uh, reach out into uh, its, uh, its empire and bring back things and people and animals. Uh, Charles the First, um, from early in his reign, just like Louis XIV does in, in Paris uh, or at Versailles, creates a collection of um, exotic birds and animals or birds and animals from all over the world from their empires. And Barlow is engaged with early members of the Royal Society established at the Restoration uh, making pictures after these creatures, which are then paintings of them, which are then engraved after those paintings uh, or, or after drawings related to those paintings um, for some of the most, what we call now, what natural philosophy and natural history call, what biology now calls some of the most important groundbreaking works of uh, species cataloging and description uh, in the 17th century. And Barlow has these ties to the Royal Society. I believe through his uncle Thomas, who was never a member of the society, but who is a good friend of people like William Petty, uh, who is a part of the society. Um, and there are met there, there are records in the Royal Society, um, not in the philosophical transactions, but in their um their own records uh, of their meetings, where William Petty is coming and saying, Can we do this for Barlow? Can we do that for Barlow? Um and Petty had even intended Barlow to illustrate um, a discourse or history on, on clothing that was never produced. So um, this just gives you a, a sense uh, of, of the other things that Barlow uh, is involved in. And what never made sense to me, you know, as I waded my way into all of this Barlow material was how you could talk about the paintings for the most part not talk about at the same time his his prints and his other pursuits and his activities. You have to consider all of these things um, as part of the same um, organic um, a whole, uh, and that's what I'm hoping that my work will do. And it's it's hard to wrap your mind around. It's hard to wrap your mind around, especially in the present, in modern times, when knowledge and the relationship between the arts and sciences is is configured in a different way. Uh, than it was in Barlow's day. So Barlow was able to have all these multiple pursuits in many ways. Yeah. I, thank you very much, Nathan. It's fantastic that we're bringing, or you are bringing back um, Barlow to life um, and giving us a better understanding of somebody who is obviously very influential. Um, That's very generous. Thank you. No, it's well meant. Thank you. Uh, uh, Yesterday, there was a set of hunt buttons sold at Salisbury, which we didn't get. Uh, um, <laughs> but I think the hunt buttons from the late 18th century carry Barlow images. Um, oh. So uh, that might be something worth looking into. Terrific. As well. I would love to continue. Another, to... another little bit of uh, um, work to be done. Um, thank you very much. Um, and just to let everybody know, the next essay uh, that we're producing, uh, which will come out in early November, is on Francis Barlow. And Nathan has agreed uh, to write that. We've got the work now, so we're putting that into print. So it's been a Barlow year for the BSAT. We bought the set of prints, which are obviously more important than even we thought when we bought them. Uh, there's this online lecture, and then there's a, um, uh, an essay for us to read as well. So thank you very much, Nathan. Happy 400 years to Barlow this last oh, month. That, that's something you didn't mention that uh, it's- Yeah, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> it, September it, it, 4th. It's, it's happenstance that it's 400 years since he was born. Um, uh, something that we didn't uh, realize when we started uh, encouraging <laughs> uh, uh, an investigation. Um, so thank you.
Uh, I remind everybody that uh, it's our annual general meeting next Friday at Welbeck in Nottinghamshire. Um, the details have been sent out. Uh, if you do intend to attend or want more information, please contact um, Sally. Our next lecture is on the 15th of December. Uh, it's on Tom Carr, the painter of hunting scenes, um, and it's given by Professor Anne Massey. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you then. Um, Before we go, can I just say that any people who are not members who would like a copy of uh, Nathan's essay, please get in touch uh, or alternatively join us, um, but get in touch through our email and we'll make sure that you're on the mailing list and we'll negotiate you getting a copy. Thank you very much for that, Sally. Thank you. So a full morning, a full morning for you, Nathan, uh, an early afternoon for us. Uh, Thank you very much. It's all much appreciated. And to everybody, the lecture has been recorded. So if anybody did miss the early part or there were technical problems, then please go to our website so that from early next week, this uh, lecture will be available to everybody. So thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.